Alexandra Ignatovic, or Sandra for short, was born in 1967 in a quiet suburb of Vancouver, Canada. Her parents, who had immigrated to Canada from Yugoslavia, were both extremely hardworking people who also had big, warm personalities and great senses of humor. They would pass all three of those qualities on to their daughter, which in turn made her a very popular person from a young age. In addition to her attractive personality, Sandra was also considered very physically attractive, so much so that when she was a teenager, her friends began to encourage her to compete in beauty pageants. Sandra was always flattered by these remarks, but would laugh them off, saying she didn't belong in something like that. But in 1985, during Sandra's senior year of high school, she finally gave in to her friend's suggestions and entered a local beauty contest called the Miss Burnaby Pageant. And much to her shock, but not to her friends, she would win. And this win would automatically enter her into the huge Miss Canada beauty competition that year, though she would lose that one. However, Sandra was not remotely phased by the loss. She actually thought it was pretty funny that she had gotten as far as she had. After high school, Sandra lived at home with her parents and attended a technical school to become a dental assistant. During this time, Sandra and her mom, Sedenka, who she was very close with, developed a hobby that they did together on the weekends. On nice days, they would find local open houses and they would pretend to be in the market for buying a home, when in reality, they just wanted to walk around the property and fantasize about what it would be like to live there. In 1987, when Sandra was 21 years old and was now working full-time as a dental assistant but still living at home, she and her mother, like usual, went to an open house one weekend in their neighborhood, and once they arrived, it was very crowded, and so they made their way off to the side and just began chatting in their family's native tongue, Serbo-Croatian. And so as they're doing this, a woman they didn't recognize walks up to them. She was this short, older woman with rosy cheeks who was grinning ear to ear. And when she reached the mother and daughter, she very excitedly began speaking in Serbo-Croatian as well. She said her name was Jelka Pesek, and she couldn't help but overhear them speaking in her native tongue. Like Sandra's parents, Jelka had immigrated to Canada from Yugoslavia, and like Sandra and her mom, Jelka was at this open house pretending to be in the market for a home when really she was just fantasizing same as they were. So these commonalities they shared immediately put them all at ease, and before long, all three of them were chatting and laughing like they were old friends. Over the course of their 15 or so minute long conversation, Yelka eventually asked Sandra pretty point blank if she was single or in a relationship. And Sandra, who was a little caught off guard by the abrupt question said, I'm single. At which point Yelka lit up and with a smile on her face, she said, well, you know, I'd love for you to meet my son, Joe. He's about your age and single too. Sandra smiled, but before she could respond, Yelka kind of waved her off like she knew she was being too pushy. And she just said, look, our family owns an automotive shop in town. It's called Sam and Sons. If either of you ever have car troubles, it's on the house. Bring your car in. And if you, Sandra, swing by, I'll introduce you to Joe. Then she handed Sandra a business card and said her goodbyes to both of them and then turned and walked away. Once she was gone, Sandra and her mother kind of chuckled about the conversation they had just had, and then they went back to just enjoying the open house. And by that evening, when the mother and daughter had gotten back to their own home, they had more or less forgotten about Yelka. However, the following day, while Sandra was out running some errands, her car's engine started making really loud knocking sounds. While she didn't know what they meant, she knew that she really needed to have someone look at her car. And so as she began to look around, wondering if an auto body shop just happened to be close to her, she remembered Yelka from the day before giving her that business card for her auto body shop. And so Sandra pulled over to the side of the road. She fished inside of her purse and she pulled out that card, the business card, and she saw the address of the auto body shop was only a couple of blocks away. And so she merged back onto the road and she began driving over. When she arrived outside of Sam and Son's auto body shop, she parked in their front lot and then she got out and she made her way into the front office. And then as soon as she stepped inside, she saw right ahead of her was this big desk and behind the desk was Yelka. And as soon as Yelka saw Sandra coming in, Yelka lit up and she said, oh my goodness, you're here, come here, come here. I gotta introduce you to my son. And that's when Sandra said, well, actually I'm here because my car actually broke down today. And I was wondering if you, know, you could have a look at it. And immediately Yelka said, oh, of course. She grabbed a mechanic, she pulled him over and said, right now go out and get Sandra's car. She has to be at the front of the line. And so the mechanic went out to get Sandra's car. And then Sandra said, you know, thank you so much. You know, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to just go step outside and just let me know when it's done. But Yelka would say, no, 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 no. You have to meet my son. Hold on just a minute. 
And so Sandra just kind of stood in the waiting room, kind of feeling a little bit awkward. And Yelka ran back into the back room behind the desk. And then she came running back out a few minutes later. And just a few seconds behind her was this handsome man in a crisp suit who had short, dark hair and a perfectly manicured mustache. And Yelka immediately grabbed him and kind of wheeled him out from behind the desk and brought him right in front of Sandra. And with a huge grin on her face, she says to Sandra, this is Joe, this is my son. He's single, you're single. You two should go on a date. And so Sandra and Joe immediately laughed because it was so pushy and so forward, it was just kind of comical. But over the course of their very short interaction, they both found each other attractive and they actually agreed to meet up for a date. And over the course of the next few weeks, the pair would go on many dates and they would become inseparable. Joe would take Sandra to the nicest restaurants in town, they would go dancing, and then sometimes they'd just hop on Joe's motorcycle and go for long rides in the countryside. Less than a month after their first meeting, Sandra was already telling her family and friends that Joe might be the one. And she would be right, because almost exactly a month after their first meeting, Joe would ask Sandra to marry him, and she would say yes. Sandra was beyond excited. She knew this proposal had been abrupt, but she didn't care. She felt like Joe was perfect. However, there was one detail about Joe that Sandra hadn't really seen fully yet, and that was his mother. Sandra was aware that Yelka could be a bit pushy. After all, she did literally tell Sandra to date her son while they stood directly in front of her son. However, after that interaction, Sandra had really not spent much time around Yelka and so hadn't formed much of an opinion of her. But as soon as wedding preparations began, that would change. Yelka wanted to plan every single detail of the wedding. You should get married in this church. You should buy this gown from the store. Your bridesmaids should wear these dresses. Here's a great music list for the wedding reception. Although she presented these as suggestions, they were more like demands. At first, Sandra tried to just roll with it and allowed Yelka to have her way with a number of the decisions, but after each concession, it just seemed like Yelka would come back with even more demands. Finally, Sandra had just had enough, and she told Yelka, you gotta stop inserting yourself into every single wedding planning decision. This is my wedding. This is Joe's wedding, not yours. And shockingly, Yelka responded by effectively saying, I know better than you, and I'm not going to stop telling you how to have the best wedding because I want it to be the best. Sandra was dumbfounded. She felt like she literally could not stop Yelka. And so she went to her fiance, and although she knew she was putting him in a really awkward situation, she told him he had to step in and tell his mom to back down, that she was totally overbearing and making this wedding process a nightmare. At first, Joe tried to act like Sandra was overreacting, but Sandra just was not having it. And she basically said, I will postpone this wedding if you don't handle this. And so after a deep sigh, Joe told Sandra, okay, I'll go talk to my mom. And sure enough, Joe would. And Yelka would step back as a result of this conversation. However, it was plainly obvious that Yelka was not happy about this. And to show her displeasure, for the rest of the wedding planning cycle, Yelka refused to look at or talk to Sandra. But as upsetting as this was for Sandra, ultimately she was kind of okay with it. Because one, Joe had demonstrated that he could have her back when she really needed him. And two, she didn't really like talking to Yelka at this point. She found her incredibly annoying, and so to have Yelka ignoring her was kind of a good deal. A few weeks before their wedding, Sandra and Joe, who at that point both still lived with their parents, decided to go out and get an apartment they could share together as a couple. And they found one. It was very small and was the only one they could actually afford, but it was relatively close to both of their families and their work, so they took it. After getting the keys, Sandra and her mom would spend a very fun weekend going out to yard sales and discount stores to decorate and furnish the apartment. And by the time they were done, Sandra and Joe loved it. On June 11th, 1988, Sandra and Joe finally got married in front of all of their friends and family. And everyone seemed to have a great time, except for Yelka. Then after the wedding, the new couple headed off to Hawaii for their honeymoon. A week later, Sandra and Joe returned to Vancouver, and when they walked into their new apartment, they were both shocked. The entire place 
had been completely redecorated. Couch covers had been switched out, the kitchen had been reorganized, bathrooms had different colored towels, the bed had different sheets on it, and it was even facing a different direction. After calling around to their families, they quickly discovered Yelka was responsible. She had used Joe's keys to slip into the apartment while they were on vacation. Sandra was furious. She and her mother had worked so hard to furnish and decorate the apartment to make it feel like her own, and now it just felt like Yelka's. It was so rude what she had done, Sandra literally couldn't believe it. Despite putting everything back the way it had been in their apartment, this was a massive violation of their privacy, and Sandra openly told Joe that she wanted nothing to do with his mother. However, it wasn't that simple for Joe. Despite her transgressions, Joe still loved his mom, and he got his paycheck from his mom. She was literally his boss at the auto body shop, so he couldn't just disown her, nor did he want to. This caused a lot of friction between the couple, but ultimately they just kind of accepted that they would need to find a way to live with Yelka and her intrusive behavior because she wasn't going anywhere. But despite Sandra's best efforts to put up with Yelka, Yelka made that nearly impossible on a regular basis. Shortly after the apartment redecorating incident, where afterwards Joe and Sandra told Yelka, you cannot sneak into our apartment when we are gone, Yelka began sneaking into the couple's apartment when they were gone. Yelka had made a copy of her son's keys and just came and went as she pleased. At first, all she did was straighten things up around the apartment and periodically would go through their fridge, throwing away old food and sometimes replacing certain food items with other food items that she believed were better in some way. At first, Joe and Sandra actually didn't notice, but when it seemed like their entire fridge was starting to become full of food neither of them remembered purchasing, they confronted Yelka and sure enough, she admitted to it. But the way she framed it was that she was simply swinging by and dropping off groceries. After this admission, privately, Sandra told Joe that he had to step in and stop Yelka from doing this. They had already told her, you can't do this, and she's doing it all over again. And Joe, he would tell his wife, oh yeah, I'm going to tell her, I'm going to tell her to stop, for sure. He actually would not. And so Yelka would just continue to come in and out of their apartment as she pleased. Sandra was furious and felt like she had totally lost control of the situation, but at the same time, she started having feelings that, you know, maybe she was overreacting. Maybe she was wrong about Yelka, and she was just hypersensitive to what she was doing, and that in reality, Yelka was being really helpful. But when Yelka, during one of her secret apartment visits, removed half of Sandra's entire wardrobe from her closet and replaced it with clothing Yelka had bought, Sandra officially had had enough. Instead of waiting for Joe to come home that evening and to figure out what to do together, Sandra just hopped in her car and drove right over to her in-law's house. When she arrived, she ran up the front steps. She didn't even knock on their door. She simply opened it and screamed at Yelka, who was straight ahead in the kitchen, that she could never come in their apartment without permission ever again. Then she screamed at Yelka to give her her clothing back immediately. Yelka seemed totally unfazed by this, and instead of saying sorry or trying to make an excuse, she just said very matter-of-factly, eh, you don't look good in your clothing. I know what you look good in. Then she walked over to a closet near the front door, pulled out several dresses and blouses and kind of chucked them at Sandra, and then holding her crumpled clothes in her arms, Sandra glared at Yelka for an extra second before turning and storming out of the house back to her car. When she got back to her apartment, Joe had come home at this point, so Sandra walked in and pretty much immediately laid into him. She explained how his mom had taken her clothes and that now she had just completely had it. She was done with Yelka. She can't come back in here. It's over. It's done. But while the couple fought, there was a knock on their front door. The couple stopped talking and Joe stood up and walked over to the door and he opened it. And shockingly, standing on the other side, was Yelka and her husband, Sam. Sandra saw them and literally ran over and slammed the door in their face. But through the now shut door, she heard Yelka call out, please let us in. I have something very important I want to tell you. Sandra could sense that Yelka's tone seemed different somehow. Perhaps she was here to apologize. It certainly seemed possible given recent events. And so while holding the doorknob, Sandra turned and looked at Joe, who had a look of, I don't know what to do on his face. And then with a very frustrated sigh, Sandra turned the doorknob and opened the front door again. And immediately, Yelka smiled at the couple 
and walked in like she owned the place. Sam followed behind her, but seemed wholly uninvested in whatever it was they were there for. Yelka strode right into the kitchen, and she took a seat at the head of the table, and then beckoned Sandra and Joe to come over and sit down as well. Sandra was already regretting her decision to let them in, but she did want to hear what Yelka had to say, and so she walked over and sat down, as did Joe. Once everyone was sitting around the table, Yelka smiled and said, Sandra, Joe, we're going to make an $85,000 down payment on this beautiful two-story house for you two to live in. We know this apartment is small and you want to start a family, and we want to give you the best home to do that in. Sandra and Joe were dumbstruck. They made very little money and had almost no savings, and so home ownership was not exactly on the horizon for them, although it was something they often fantasized about. But now, this fantasy could become a reality if they just said yes to Yelka. And so with Yelka sitting there staring at them intently with a big grin on her face, eagerly awaiting their answer, the couple exchanged a few quick glances at each other, kind of feeling each other out, and then they said, okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. Yelka was extremely pleased. She hugged them both and asked them to come by the property the next day to have a look around. And then Yelka and Sam got up and they left. That night, Sandra and Joe lay awake in bed talking about this incredible thing that had happened. And they came to the conclusion that Yelka must have been trying to make some sort of peace offering. That this was effectively a way for her to say sorry for what had transpired between them. And so by the time Sandra fell asleep that night, she was feeling very optimistic that her relationship with Yelka was about to improve. The following day, Sandra and Joe drove over to the house that they had just agreed to let Yelka and Sam put the down payment on. And right away, what stood out to Sandra was the home's proximity to Yelka's house. It was only about five minutes drive away, much closer than their current apartment was to Yelka's house. Also, as soon as Yelka arrived in her car and got out to talk to them on the sidewalk, she was absolutely brimming with excitement, talking about how she couldn't wait to start decorating the inside of the house. It was like she was moving into the house. Alarm bells were going off in Sandra's head. This arrangement clearly was a mistake. But at the same time, Sandra felt like they were in too deep. They had already agreed to do this. How could they possibly back out now? So against her better judgment, a few weeks later, the sale of this new house was finalized and Sandra and Joe moved in. But within a week of living there, everything fell apart. Sandra had mentioned to Joe that she wanted to put in a simple red accent tile along the back of the kitchen wall. Joe had apparently relayed this information to his mother, who promptly arrived at the house specifically to tell Sandra she wasn't allowed to do that, that Yelka already had plans for the kitchen. A massive fight broke out between the two women that ended with Sandra saying, you know what, I'm done. I'm leaving, I'm moving in with my mom. Then Sandra did just that. She grabbed her things, put them in the car, and she left. Joe, who by now seemed to have just given up trying to keep the peace between his wife and his mother, didn't even try to stop her. It looked like Joe and Sandra's marriage was destined to fail. Yelka was just too much to overcome. But only a week after moving back in with her mother, Sandra started to feel nauseous. She took a pregnancy test and it revealed that she was pregnant. She was going to have Joe's baby. Sandra had a decision to make, return to Joe and by extension return to Yelka or raise the child on her own. She called Joe to break the pregnancy news and talk about the way ahead for them and he was extremely excited and begged her to come back and live in the house together again, and he promised he would keep his mother under control. By the end of the call, Sandra decided she was willing to go back and give it another shot, not because Joe was so convincing or that she thought Yelka was really going to change, but because she felt like she owed it to her unborn child. And much to Sandra's surprise, once she moved back into the house with Joe, it actually was much better than before. Namely because Yelka actually seemed to be giving them space. Clearly, Joe had laid down the law with her, and Yelka was respecting it. She gave them so much space that by the time Sandra actually gave birth to her son Brandon, she found herself secretly starting to kind of like Yelka, just a little bit. Six months after Brandon was born, Sandra and Joe were both starting to feel very run down from being on baby duty 24-7, and so Joe suggested they go out on a date night that Friday. Sandra loved the idea and asked Joe to get them a babysitter. And then once he said he had, they made reservations for their favorite restaurant. When Friday came around, as Sandra was getting ready for the night, they heard the babysitter knock on the front door. 
Sandra opened the door and saw Yelka. Despite her recent good behavior, Sandra was still very much on edge, wondering when the old Yelka was going to come back out again. And so her immediate reaction to seeing Yelka on the other side of this door was, what are you doing here? Yelka looked at her funny and said, I'm your babysitter. Joe asked me. Sandra immediately whipped her head around and looked at Joe, who was now standing very sheepishly in the middle of the room. Before Sandra could say anything to him, Yelka had slipped past her into the house and was already talking about how she and Brandon were going to have such a wonderful night together and that everything was going to be just fine. Sandra shut the door and then grabbed Joe and pulled him into another room and told him she didn't like this, that he should have told her he was going to have her babysit their son. But Joe told her she was overreacting, that, you know, despite their past issues, his mom was really excellent with kids. This would be fine. Sandra did not like this, but eventually conceded. And then before the couple left, Sandra gave Yelka very specific instructions for how to care for Brandon, what to feed him, what time to put him to bed, etc. And the whole time, Yelka just reassured Sandra that it was going to be just fine. Just go out and have fun. Finally, after giving all the instructions she could possibly think of, Sandra and Joe said goodbye and they left. They went out to their favorite restaurant and then afterwards they went to a club to go dancing. And as soon as they got there, Sandra stepped away and hopped on a payphone to call Yelka to make sure everything was going okay with their son. And when Yelka picked up, she informed Sandra that the boy was, quote, out like a light because apparently she had given him some tea from the old country. Sandra said, what? I told you he only takes breast milk. What did you give him? And Yelka just laughed and said, don't worry about it. It's fine. He's asleep. Go enjoy yourself. Sandra was horrified. She hung up on Yelka and ran back into the club. She grabbed Joe and said, your mom just fed something to Brandon that she shouldn't have. We have to go. The two ran from the club. They hopped in the car and then Sandra flew back to their house. As soon as they were parked outside, she ran up the steps into the house, right past Yelka, into her son's nursery and then standing next to his crib, she reached down and she lifted him up, which should have woken him up, but it didn't. He just lay limp in her arms. And so immediately Sandra pressed his mouth up against her ear to see if he was still breathing and barely she could tell he was still breathing. But despite screaming his name and moving him around, nothing was waking him up. And so by this point, Yelka had come into the room and she was trying to convince Sandra that this was no big deal, that, you know, the tea from the old country works great. You got nothing to worry about. But at this point, Sandra is panicking and she's screaming at Yelka to tell her what was in the tea you gave him. But Yelka just wouldn't give her an answer. She just kept laughing and saying it was fine. And so finally, Sandra just takes her son and runs past Yelka, runs past Joe. She runs out to the car. She strapped her little boy into his car seat and then she flew to the emergency room. And then when she got there, she hopped out. She's carrying her baby. She's hysterically crying. And she runs in through the doors and all the doctors and nurses, they run over and they take the child from her and they're asking all these questions. They're trying to figure out what's going on. And they start feeling for a pulse and they would find one. However, it was very, very slow. And so they whisked Brandon away into an exam room to work on him and figure out what was going on. Meanwhile, Sandra just had to pace in the waiting room, crying hysterically, having no idea what's happening to her boy. But luckily, just a few minutes later, one of the doctors would come back out of the exam room and they would tell Sandra that, you know, we think your son's going to be just fine. We don't know what he consumed, but whatever it was, it was not good. And he should never have that again. And then he told Sandra she could come back and actually be with her son again. And so Sandra left the waiting room and she went down the hall. She went into the room where her son was. And there laying on this bed with wires and tubes connected to him is her little boy who still looks totally lifeless. And so Sandra walked around and she sat down next to the bed and she laid her head down on the pillow and just looked at her son. And right there in that moment, she decided that she was officially done with Yelka, even if it meant being done with Joe. A few minutes later, when Joe arrived by himself, Sandra would tell him he needed to choose. It was either going to be her or his mother. Unlike other times, Joe was not quick to come to his wife's side. In his mind, Sandra had become as much to blame for the drama as his mother was. And so after getting very frustrated with Sandra, he said, you know what? You keep yelling at my mom and I don't like it. She only wants to help and be supportive and you just can't accept that. So I'm sorry, but I'm choosing my mom, not you. And Sandra would say, fine. And then the two of them just sat in silence on opposite sides of their son for the next hour. 
until the doctors came back in and gave them the okay to take their son home, at which point Sandra immediately stood up and grabbed Brandon, and she and her son left the hospital without another word to Joe. She would drive her son to her mother's house and drop him off with her parents, and then she would go back to Joe's house, collect most of her things, and then move into her mom's house with her son. The following day, she would file for divorce. Immediately, the divorce became very nasty. Sandra didn't want Brandon anywhere near Yelka, so she decided to seek full custody of him. However, Joe, who by this point had gone from being something of an innocent bystander caught in the middle of two people he loved, to being aggressively on his mother's side, and therefore aggressively opposed to Sandra, told Sandra that he would be seeking full custody of Brandon as well. While these legal proceedings were going on, Joe's parents took it upon themselves to change all the locks of the house, knowing some of Sandra's things were still tucked away in the attic. Yelka also had their lawyer send Sandra a letter explaining that she was now forbidden from stepping foot inside of that house without express permission from Yelka. But as Joe and his mother made these punitive moves, Sandra would receive a huge legal break. The judge, in their case, had come to a decision. Sandra would get full custody of Brandon, and Joe would be required to pay child support and an alimony payment. The judge also ruled that Sandra would get primary ownership status of the house that Yelka had put the down payment on, and on top of all of that, based on Yelka's previous behavior, she was forbidden from having any contact with both Sandra and Brandon. Joe and his family were beyond outraged. But their only recourse was to be on their best behavior and try to file an appeal and have the judge change the ruling. So in the meantime, Joe very reluctantly and bitterly moved out of the house and then Sandra and Brandon moved back in. Over the following few months, Joe didn't pay a dime of child support or alimony payments to Sandra. He also didn't bother to try to get in touch about seeing his son. Sandra was very upset about this. However, she was mostly just upset for her son whose father basically had abandoned him. But as the silence between them grew, Sandra started to think to herself that maybe it was for the best. Fast forward about a year and a half to the summer of 1992, Joe was still not paying any support money to Sandra, and he and Sandra were still not talking, minus during court appearances for the appeals that had been filed. And during those short interactions, Joe would be openly cold and hateful toward his ex-wife, which Sandra could clearly tell made Yelka very happy. But Sandra didn't care. She had her son, she had the house, and she felt like no matter what they said or they did, they weren't going to stop her from trying to have the best life she could have. But Sandra's life was about to take a drastic and unexpected turn. In June of that year, Sandra walked out to her mailbox in the morning and found a small package with no return address on it. She brought the package inside, opened it up, and saw that it contained a paperback novel called The Deaths of Cindy James. It was a non-fiction account of a woman named Cindy James, who for years had been harassed by some unknown person who ultimately killed her and got away with it. Sandra's first thought when she saw this book was that, you know, maybe she had accidentally signed up for a book club or something. And so she just put the book on the table and went about her day. That evening, after work, she saw the book on the table and just picked it up and sat down and began flipping through the pages for the first time. And right away, she noticed someone had underlined several passages in the book. When Sandra began reading these highlighted sections in the book, she started to feel very uncomfortable. All the highlighted sections were descriptions of the specific awful things that had happened to Cindy. Namely, her tree in her front yard had been lit on fire, she started getting threatening phone calls at all hours of the night, strangers would lurk on her property, cars followed her around when she was out in town, and then the last underlined passage was about Cindy's death, and only two words were underlined. You're dead. Sandra didn't know what to make of this book, but it definitely felt threatening. She assumed Joe had sent it just to be cruel. Two days later, Sandra was sitting in her living room with a friend, when they both suddenly heard a strange sound coming from the outside of the front of her house. All of the windows that looked into the front yard had the curtains drawn, and so Sandra and her friend stood up and walked over and pulled one of the curtains aside, and right in the middle of the front of her property on her front lawn, her tree was on fire, just like the Cindy James book. 
In fact, as soon as Sandra saw this, she handed Brandon to her friend and she ran into the kitchen and she grabbed the book, the Cindy James book, and she ran back and she flipped through the pages and she found the passage about the tree and she showed it to her friend and she said, look, someone sent me this two days ago and now they're doing what's happening in the book to me. Sandra would call the fire department and the police department and they would all show up and they would put the fire out. And then afterwards, Sandra would speak to the officers and she would explain the situation about her divorce and how she'd received this book. But the police didn't have much they could do. Even if Joe had done this, there was no proof. So they just told her to, you know, be vigilant and report anything strange you see. And if you call us, we'll come out immediately. Over the following weeks, a man started calling Sandra's house in the middle of the night. He never said anything. He just breathed into the phone. The calls became so frequent that Sandra had to disconnect her phone at night just so she and Brandon could sleep. She would tell the police about the calls, but again, there was just nothing they could do. About a month after the calls had begun, Sandra was giving her son a bath in their house, and after he was all clean, she scooped him up in a towel and she carried him across the hall into his room, which was on the first floor in the back of the house. And when she walked into his room, the light was off, so it's totally dark, and the curtains that cover the back window were actually pulled to the side, revealing a clear view into the backyard. And standing right on the outside of her house, looking into her son's window, is this large man with a ski mask on. And he can clearly see that Sandra is looking at him, but he's totally unfazed. In fact, when he can tell that Sandra has made eye contact with him, he leans forward into the glass before turning and walking out of sight. Sandra immediately runs all over her house, making sure all the doors are locked. And then as she's reconnecting her phone to call 911, she hears banging on windows and she hears banging on the walls. And then by the time the police show up, there's no sign that anybody was there. And so once again, the police had to say to her, sorry, you're on your own. The next day, when Sandra noticed a car was now clearly following her in town, she realized all of the underlined sections of the Cindy James book had now happened to her in real life, except for one, the last underlined section, the one where Cindy dies. Scared for her life, Sandra hired a private investigator to both watch her home and try to figure out who was behind this. But after a couple of weeks, the nightly calls and occasional footsteps outside of her windows at night continued, and the private detective had gotten no closer to figuring out who was behind this. However, he did tell Sandra that he had been following Joe around and watching him and his family, and they all appeared to just be living a normal life. On the afternoon of August 5th of that year, so two months after receiving the Cindy James book in the mail, Sandra walked out of her dental office with her coworker, Bernice. That day, Sandra was supposed to give Bernice a ride home. So the pair walked across the parking lot to the road where Sandra's car was parked. Sandra hopped in the driver's seat and fired up the engine, while Bernice hopped in the passenger seat and bent down to shove her bag underneath the seat below her. As Bernice was bent down, she suddenly heard gunfire on her left. She screamed and stayed bent forward, gripping the back of her head to protect herself. And then when the shooting stopped, Bernice sat up and looked out the front window and she saw a red car speeding away from them. Then she turned to look at Sandra and she saw her coworker was slumped forward. Two of the six shots that had been fired from that red car had struck Sandra in the head. Bernice ran out of the car and she got help and before long the police and paramedics were there, but by the time they reached Sandra, it was too late. She was already deceased. After her death, the police immediately turned their attention to Joe as their primary suspect. However, despite showing no emotion when he was told the mother of his child had just been murdered, he did have a rock solid alibi. He had been at a public swimming pool during the shooting and even had a receipt to prove it. But the police just weren't buying it. Something seemed off about him. So they began staking out Joe's parents' house, which is where he was living at the time, watching to see what Joe did and who he talked to. And for the first four days, nothing unusual happened. But on the fifth day, the police were watching the house from a distance when Yelka suddenly came out the front door and hopped in her car and started to back down her driveway. But before she reached the end of the driveway, she came to a stop. Then a man came running out of her house who was neither Joe nor her husband, and he climbed into the back seat of her car and then laid down on the floorboards so no one could see him. 
The police thought this was very odd, so they decided to trail Yelka. They would follow her to a nearby mall parking garage where she and this man would climb out of the vehicle and go into the mall at different times as if they were trying to make it seem like they didn't know each other. One of the officers would stay in the parking garage watching Yelka's car while the other officer went into the mall to see what these two were up to. But very quickly, that officer lost sight of both Yelka and this man, and so he had to return back to the parking garage with his partner. A little while later, the two officers watched as Yelka returned to her car, and then a few moments later, so too did this man, who promptly climbed back into her car and got down on the floorboards out of sight again. The police would trail Yelka back to her house, where as soon as she parked in the driveway, the man in the back climbed out and walked to the front of the property, hopped in a parked car, and drove off. The police followed this man and pulled him over less than a mile away, and when he got out of the car, something fell out of his pocket that blew the case wide open. It would turn out, Joe really hadn't been involved in what happened to Sandra. However, his mother Yelka had. She had grown to hate Sandra so much she had decided she wanted to get rid of her, and she had just the plan in mind. Yelka was obsessed with the story of Cindy James, and so she decided she would force Sandra to relive Cindy's nightmare all the way to its grisly conclusion. After doing some digging, Yelka discovered one of her family friends, a man named Milan Nanatic, had connections to a hitman named David Segoviano. David was really just a seedy criminal willing to do just about anything for money. Yelka instantly told Milan to hire David to take out Sandra. However, she stressed that David had to first carry out all the underlined segments of the Cindy James book before he shot her down. Because Yelka didn't just want to kill Sandra, she wanted to torture her first. Milan Nanatic was the man who was hiding in Yelka's car. The two had driven to that mall so that Yelka could take $30,000 in cash out of a bank that she was paying to Milan for organizing the hit and then Milan was going to take a portion of that and pay it to David, the shooter. And so when Milan got pulled over by police, when he stood up, the cash that he had been paid by Yelka was jammed in his pockets. And so literally he stood up and hundreds and hundreds of dollars began falling out of his pockets. And very quickly, the police were able to figure out what it was for. Less than a year later, Yelka, Milan, and David were tried and convicted for the murder of Sandra Pesek. They were all given the maximum sentence for first-degree murder in Canada, which is 25 years. Joe Pesek was never charged with a crime. As for Sandra's son, he would go on to be raised by Sandra's mother. On Sunday, August 26, 1990, a 56-year-old woman named Patricia Powell and her husband, Frank, pulled into a parking lot outside of this beautiful three-story white apartment building in Gainesville, Florida. Gainesville is this beautiful little town in northern Florida that is home to the massive University of Florida, which is known for their big-time football team and their big-time college party scene. Patricia and Frank's daughter, 17-year-old Christine, was going to be a freshman that year at the University of Florida. And apparently, she had been so excited after getting her acceptance letter that her dad, Frank, had gone out and got a gold necklace for her that had the school's mascot, an alligator, dangling from it and apparently Christine wore this all the time. Two days earlier, Christine and her new roommate, 18-year-old Sonia Larson, the two had actually met over the summer when they took some summer classes together, they had actually already come to Gainesville and they had moved in to this white apartment complex that Patricia and Frank were now parked outside of. And after unpacking some of their things in their apartment, Christine and Sonia had left and gone into town and grabbed a bite to eat at a local restaurant. And then afterwards, Christine had used a payphone to call back home and tell her parents how well it was going and how much she already enjoyed her roommate and how excited she was for the year. And she told Patricia and Frank that she would call them the following day. But the following day came and went and Patricia and Frank did not hear from their daughter. And they had no way to actually call her because she had not set up her landline in her apartment. But Patricia and Frank, they told each other that of course everything was fine. You know, she just got to college, she's excited, she's probably out having a good time and she just forgot to call. And anyways, Patricia and Frank had already planned a visit to see their daughter in Gainesville the next day, which was Sunday. 
And so fast forward back to that Sunday and Patricia and Frank are now parked outside of their daughter's apartment complex. They still haven't heard from her, but they're still telling themselves everything's fine. She's probably just busy. And so they get out of their car and they walk over to the building and they go through one of the front access doors that brings them into the building. They find themselves inside of this carpeted stairwell where at every level on the way up, there were doors leading off to each of the apartments. They made their way up to the second level where they knew their daughter's apartment was and they walk up to her door and before they even knock or turn the doorknob or anything, they notice on the door, there are all these notes, these handwritten notes that have been taped all over it. And they read a couple of them and they were notes from some of Christine and Sonia's friends on campus that apparently had tried to stop by over the last weekend, but had not been able to make contact with Christine or Sonia. And so these notes said things like, hey, Christine, you know, we came over to try to get you to come out with us, but you didn't come to the door. So we left without you. Sorry, you know, give us a call when you get in. And so obviously the parents are totally worried given the circumstances. They don't know where their daughter is. They've been telling themselves everything is fine. And now these notes make it seem like everything is not fine. But the parents, they keep their cool and they just start knocking on the door and calling out for their daughter. But there's no answer. And so Patricia and Frank, they start to panic at this point and they leave the carpeted stairwell. They go outside and they find a maintenance worker that works for this building. And they explain their situation with their daughter and how they can't get in touch with her. And can he please let them in to make sure she's okay? The maintenance worker said he couldn't without speaking to his manager. And so he goes to his manager and the manager, she says, that's fine, but we need to get the police involved. They need to escort us into the apartment. And so the maintenance worker calls the police and requests this escort. And a few minutes later, a single Gainesville police officer arrives at the apartment complex. And he tells Patricia and Frank that just as a precaution, I need you guys to stay outside. So they stay right outside those front access doors. They're outside of the apartment building. And then this officer, along with the maintenance worker and the manager of the building, those three, they go inside the stairwell, they go up to the second floor. And at that point, the maintenance worker gets out his keys, he finds the right one, and he opens Christine and Sonia's door. The door swings open and immediately the police officer yells out for the two girls, but there's no answer. And so the officer is first into the apartment, which basically immediately opens up to their living room. And in the middle of the living room is a couch that's angled towards the right side of the room where a TV had been set up. And so the officer, again, as he walks in, he's calling out, trying to get the girl's attention, but there's no answer. Behind him is the maintenance worker and the building manager. And they begin making their way towards the right side of the living room over towards that TV to see if maybe someone was laying on the couch. And as they round that corner and can finally actually see the front of the couch, the maintenance worker, after seeing what he saw, screams out and runs out of the apartment. He runs down the stairs, out the access doors, and begins vomiting on the grass and sobbing right right next to Frank and Patricia. Naturally, Frank and Patricia, after seeing this, are immediately concerned that something's wrong with their daughter. And so they run inside, they go up the stairs and they start running into the apartment and the police officer and the building manager, they try to stop them from getting in, but there was nothing stopping them. They managed to push past those two. They get into the living room and they're calling out for their daughter. And eventually they make their way over to the side of the couch and they see their daughter, Christine. She is lying on the ground in front of the couch Couch. She's on her back, she has no clothes on, and she's been stabbed to death. And whoever has killed her has positioned her in this very suggestive, sexual, lewd position as if they were trying to demean her as much as possible and shock whoever found her. And so after these totally devastated and wrecked parents are escorted out of the apartment, this one police officer, he continues searching the apartment. And so he searches the rest of the first floor. There's no sign of Sonia. He goes upstairs and he finds Sonia. She's laying on her bed. She also has no clothes on. She's been stabbed to death. And she's positioned on the side of the bed in a sort of suggestive lewd position, much like Christine downstairs. It would later be determined that Christine had been sexually assaulted, but Sonia had not been. The officer at this point leaves the apartment. He goes outside. He walks past the grieving parents who are being consoled by the building manager and the maintenance worker. And the officer goes over to his car and he uses his radio to call in for backup. 
a forensics team comes out to the apartment and they begin processing the scene. And right away, they discover on the outside of the door frame of the door leading into the apartment, there were markings on the edge that looked like someone had used a screwdriver or some similar instrument to pop open the door. They also found there was a towel and some soap that was lying on the ground near Christine's body and near the couch that had apparently been used to both clean Christine's body and also clean some other parts of the apartment. And so they believe this was done to try to intentionally destroy evidence, suggesting the killer or killers were somewhat sophisticated. They also discovered there was some residue on Christine's wrists that indicated at some point her hands had been bound by duct tape. But when she was found, her hands were not bound and there was no duct tape from her wrists. And so whoever had done this had at some point removed the duct tape and taken it away. And so investigators believed that the killer or killers had used the duct tape to immobilize Christine for the attack. And then after she was deceased, they had removed that tape in order to be able to get her arms up over her head, which seemed to increase the shock value of this lewd position they had put her in. Based on what they saw inside of this apartment, the police were convinced they were up against a group of killers or a killer that had targeted these two girls. That this was not some random attack, that this was calculated, this was on purpose. And if they didn't get caught, they were going to strike again. And so even though the police really didn't have any leads to operate on, they just had this crime scene and they were looking for maybe someone with duct tape and a knife and a screwdriver. I mean, that was really about it at this point. And so even though they have virtually nothing, because there were thousands and thousands of young people flooding Gainesville for the start of the new school year at the University of Florida, literally the following day, Monday, classes were starting. Because of all these young people in town, the police felt it was very important that they got the media to put out a a bulletin to all these people in town that there was potentially a killer or killers on the loose. And so that night, Sunday evening, this news bulletin goes out and it basically just told residents of Gainesville to stay indoors and stay in groups. And if you needed to go outside, travel in groups and just overall stay vigilant until we figure out who did this. 12 hours before Christine Powell and Sonia Larson were discovered, an 18 year old Gainesville woman named Krista Hoyt did not show up for work. Krista was a student at Santa Fe Community College, which was right down the road from the University of Florida. That year, she was planning to transfer to the University of Florida. And then after graduation, she wanted to pursue a career in forensics with the FBI. And so given her interest in law enforcement, while she was a student, she had gotten a part-time job working in the records department of the sheriff's office. And apparently at this sheriff's office, she was famous for always coming to work, no matter what including the time that she got her wisdom teeth removed and then an hour after coming home, she showed up for work. And so on this Saturday night when Krista was supposed to be showing up for work and she didn't and she didn't call ahead and no one could get in touch with her on her landline, everybody at the sheriff's office was really concerned. And so they waited around for about an hour hoping that she might just show up with some story about why she was late, but she never showed up, she didn't call, they still couldn't get in touch with her. And so in the very early hours of Sunday morning, the sheriff's office called the Gainesville police and asked them to do a welfare check on Krista. And so two police officers from the Gainesville Police Department, they show up at the apartment belonging to Krista Hoyt. Krista lived alone and she lived about two miles away from Christine Powell and Sonia Larson. And so these two officers, they get there and they walk up to the front door and they knock, but there's no answer. And they try the doorknob, it's locked. And so one of the officers walks around to the back of this apartment and he sees there's a glass sliding door. And so he knocks on the glass sliding door, there's no answer. He tries the door, it's locked. And then he notices the the drape that's inside the apartment that's covering up this sliding glass door, it reaches almost to the ground, but not all the way. There's a couple of inches on the bottom where if you were laying on the ground, you could actually look through this little space and see into the apartment. And so that's what he does. He lies down and he puts his flashlight up and he looks through this couple inch gap on this window. And as soon as the light illuminates what's inside of this apartment, he finds Krista. Krista is sitting on the edge of a bed that's not that far away from the sliding glass door and she's facing the door. She's kind of hunched over at the edge of the bed. She's got no clothes on and she's got stab marks all over her back. 
and she's missing her head. And her head was next to the bed to the left, up on the shelf, and it was positioned in such a way that it almost appeared like the head was looking down at the detached body. When this crime scene was processed, the forensics team immediately noticed there were marks on the back sliding glass door where someone had used probably a screwdriver or something similar to pop the door open. And then they also found residue of duct tape on Krista's wrists, but the duct tape was gone. She was found with her hands not bound. It would later be determined that Krista had been sexually assaulted before she had been murdered. The obvious similarities between Krista's crime scene and Christine and Sonia's crime scene were initially only recognized by Gainesville police because much of the information about the two crime scenes was not public. But that night, Sunday evening, when the police went to the media and asked them to put out that bulletin to all Gainesville residents to say that there could be a killer or killers on the loose, it didn't take long for residents of Gainesville and news anchors to begin speculating that you have these two murders that have happened really close together physically. They're less than two miles apart, and they've probably occurred within the last 24, 48 hours. So they've happened in rapid succession. They're both unsolved. And so even without intimate details of the crime, scene, it wasn't hard to say, I think these two are probably connected. And so that night, Sunday evening, Gainesville really went into a state of panic. And within hours of this news, you had stores all over Gainesville that had sold out their deadbolts and locks, their mace, their stun guns, their baseball bats, their actual guns, their knives. I mean, people were really trying to arm themselves to protect themselves against this unknown threat that was murdering students in Gainesville. And the police, even though they did not come out and substantiate the claims that, you know, perhaps these two homicides are connected, they did believe they were. And so that night, Sunday night, as all this chaos is kind of unfolding in town, the police put hundreds of officers all over the place, on foot on every street corner. They had police cars and trucks parked all over the place. I mean, the entire town was on an extreme heightened alert because the police believed another attack was imminent. And so all they could do was try to come out in force to try to discourage the killer or killers from striking again. But as it would turn out, it didn't work. By the following morning, so Monday morning, what was happening in Gainesville had gone from just being a Florida story to a national story, and everybody all over the country was talking about it. And one woman named Lisa Byers, who was in her 20s, she did not live in Gainesville, but she had a very close friend who did. She was 23-year-old Tracy Paulus. Tracy had taken some years off from college, but that year had decided to go back and give it another go. And so she was enrolled at the University of Florida. And so Lisa called Tracy and said, hey, you know, I'm watching the news. This is crazy what's happening in your town. How are you holding up? And Tracy would tell her that, you know, I'm just as concerned as everybody else. It's terrifying to think there are killer or killers on the loose, but I think I'm okay because I have my roommate. Tracy's roommate was 23-year-old Manny Taboda, who was this big, strong, former football player who was very close with Tracy. The two had never dated, but they had been very good friends for a number of years. And he too had taken some time off of school and had agreed to go back because Tracy had convinced him, you know, come back, get your degree with me and we'll live together. And so when the news broke about these killings happening in their town, Manny had told Tracy that he would protect her, that nothing would happen to her. And so when Lisa heard this from Tracy, that she thought that she was okay because she has Manny and, you know, he'll look after her and they were not planning to really leave the apartment much besides classes. You know, Lisa was reassured, but she was still worried. And so she told Tracy, please give me a call this evening after you come back from classes, just to let me know that everything is okay. And so Tracy said she would, and then they hung up. And then that evening, Tracy did not call Lisa back. So Lisa tried calling Tracy, but no one picked up. And so that night, Lisa went to bed. She was very worried, but she went to sleep. And then early the next morning, which was Tuesday morning, she tried calling Tracy again, but there was no answer. And so Lisa reached out to a mutual friend of theirs that lived in the same apartment complex in Gainesville. His name was Tommy. And so she asked Tommy, can you please go over to Tracy's apartment and make sure she and Manny are okay? And so Tommy said, no problem. I'll give you a call from Tracy's landline once I talk to her. And so about five minutes later, Tracy got a call, she picked it up, and it was Tommy calling from Tracy's landline, and he was just screaming. When the police arrived at Tracy's apartment, they found Tracy in her bedroom, and like the other victims, she had no clothes on, she was positioned on the side of the bed in a very suggestive, lewd position, she had been stabbed to death, and it would turn out she had been sexually assaulted. And then down the hall from Tracy, they found Manny. He was in his bed, and he too had been stabbed to death. 
except he had his clothes on and he was not positioned in a suggestive position. He had kind of died wherever he was and that was the position they found him in. The forensics team, when they processed the scene, they found markings on the outside of the back sliding door where it looked like someone had used a screwdriver to pop open the door. And then on Tracy's wrists, they found that residue from duct tape, but there was no duct tape, it had been removed. At this point to the police, it was undeniable that they were up against a serial killer or killers. And when the news broke that there was now a fourth and fifth victim and they were both college students and one of them was now this big strapping man that apparently was taken down just as easily as these other four petite women, this threw Gainesville into an absolute state of pandemonium. Suddenly it felt like no one could protect them. The people in Gainesville, they were fair game. It didn't matter that police were out in force in the streets and you had people walking around with guns and baseball bats and mace and you had people locking their doors and sleeping in groups it was like no measures were actually stopping these killings from happening whoever was doing it was killing with impunity and so that day tuesday you had hundreds and hundreds of students from the university of florida just leaving the school who just didn't come back and as for the police they called in the fbi and the national guard and so by that night tuesday night there were literally hundreds of officers and state police officers officers all over the place. There were helicopters overhead, both police helicopters and news helicopters with spotlights. They had National Guard military style trucks all over the place. And so Gainesville was really at the highest alert you could possibly be on. But even still, the people of Gainesville, they were not going to feel safe until the police made an arrest. And the next day, just 24 hours after Tracy and Manny had been found, the police did just that. After receiving dozens and dozens of tips about one particular individual, they were able to arrest 19-year-old Ed Humphreys, who was a freshman at the University of Florida. They arrested him for domestic abuse because he had actually struck his grandmother in the face. And so they pick him up for domestic abuse, but they set his bail at a whopping $1 million, which is way higher than you would normally expect for a domestic abuse charge. But this was a unique circumstance where he was being arrested for one thing, but really he was being looked at as the suspect of these five homicides. And so the police really needed him to stay behind bars and this massive bail that did that. He had no way to pay it. And so while Ed was behind bars, the police began investigating him and they found there was a lot of reasons to believe he was the serial killer. He had shown he was willing to be violent because after all, he punched his grandmother in the face and people that knew him said he was totally mentally unstable and that he hated women and that he would walk around with a knife on his belt basically all the time. And at night, he was known to walk around the forest of Gainesville, there were these very thick forests that kind of butted up against the University of Florida. And he would walk through the forest at night, which put him very close to the different apartment buildings where all the victims were found. And on top of all that, Ed Humphreys just looked like what you would imagine a serial killer would look like. He had all these deep scars all over his face and his eyes looked totally hollow, like he was permanently on drugs. And he was seen smiling at the cameras when he was led in and out of the courtroom. And to make him even more more suspicious, as soon as he was arrested, the attack stopped. There were no more slayings in Gainesville. And so naturally, the country believed Ed was the guy. Basically, everyone thought Ed was the guy. But it came back that his blood type was type A, and the killer or killer's blood type, the blood that had been found at the various crime scenes, was type B. Now, this did not clear Ed of guilt because people believed there was a chance that, you know, he could have been involved in some way. Perhaps he had an accomplice or multiple accomplices. But when this news broke, pretty much everybody was back on edge because clearly there's at least one or more killers that are still on the loose. Shortly after this blood type discrepancy presented itself, the FBI approached the Gainesville police and said, hey, why don't you use our VCAP program? VCAP stands for Violent Crime Apprehension Program. And what it was, was this computer program where it allowed investigators to input details of their crime they were investigating. And when they submitted it, it would be compared against this huge database of other crimes in the country. And if there were any similarities with any other crime, those similar 
crimes would get popped on screen. And so when the Gainesville police input the information from these five student slayings in Gainesville, the computer program spit out a single match. It was from an unsolved triple homicide in 1989 in Shreveport, Louisiana, which is a town located about 800 miles to the northwest of Gainesville. Shreveport, back in the late 1980s, was considered so safe by its residents that many of them didn't lock their front doors and they would leave their car keys just sitting on their front dash. But in 1989, that would all change. On Friday, November 3rd of that year, eight-year-old Sean Grissom was dropped off at his grandfather's house in Shreveport. He was there to celebrate his eighth birthday. And so his grandfather was this 56-year-old man named Tom who was divorced and he was getting ready to retire soon. And he was also trying to spend more time with his grandson. And so he was very excited about having Sean over. Also staying at this house with Sean and his grandfather was Sean's aunt, 24-year-old Julie Grissom, who was a college student. She was attending Louisiana State University in Shreveport. When Sean was dropped off by his mother at his grandfather's house, the grandfather, Tom, yelled out to the boy's mother and said, you know, I'll have him back by Monday. I'll drop him off. You know, see you later. And so Sean's mother, she leaves. And that day and the following day, she doesn't hear from Sean's grandfather or from Julie. And so come Sunday night, she tries calling them to, you know, see what's going on. She knows they're having a great time and doesn't really want to interrupt them, but she also hasn't heard from them, but they don't pick up. She convinces herself that everything is just fine, that I'm sure there's an explanation. They're probably just having a great time. They don't want to call me. And so she ends up going to bed. And so the next morning, Monday morning, when Sean is supposed to be dropped off early enough that she can take him to school, when he doesn't show up, the mother calls the grandfather back and tries to get in touch and figure out what's going on, but she can't get in touch with him. And so she's telling herself that, okay, well, you know, his grandfather must have just dropped him off at school. And so the mother calls Sean's school and the school says, no, we have not seen Sean today and we haven't heard from him. So we don't know what's going on. And so now Sean's mother is terrified. She calls the police and the police actually get in touch with the neighbor of Tom Grissom. And they ask this neighbor, hey, can you go next door and just make sure Tom and Sean and Julie are okay? And so this neighbor says, no problem. They leave their house and immediately they notice as they're looking at Tom's house that the two cars in the driveway had not left since Friday. It was just something the neighbor noticed. And then they also noticed that there were two newspapers at the end of the driveway. It was the Monday and Sunday paper. And they knew Tom always read the newspaper. And so the idea that he would just leave them sitting at the end of the driveway, that didn't really add up. And so the neighbor walks around to the front door and they notice there are lights on inside and they knock on the front door, but there's no answer. They try the front door, but it's locked. And so they end up going around to the very back of the house and they're able to get into the house through the garage. And then through the garage, they open another door that leads into the main part of the house. And this neighbor, they immediately see on the ground towards the back door near the kitchen is Tom. He's laying on the ground and he's obviously deceased. And so this neighbor, they run out, they call the police, the police come back over, they go inside the house and sure enough, they find Tom Grissom has been stabbed to death. He's laying on the ground near the back door. They find Sean Grissom, the eight-year-old, he's slouched over on the couch in front of the TV and he's been stabbed to death as well. And then upstairs, they found 24-year-old Julie, the aunt, and she was positioned on the edge of the bed in this very suggestive way. She had no clothes on and she had been stabbed to death and it would later be determined she had also been sexually assaulted before she was killed and they also discover there's vinegar on her body as if whoever's done this has attempted to clean her with vinegar there was no sign of a robbery in the house or ransacking in the house there was no sign of forced entry overall the investigators said this was a very neat crime scene as if whoever did this had done this with great intentionality and so after kind of going through the crime scene the police really didn't have any leads to go off of and so this crime went unsolved and so as these Gainesville police are are looking at this report in this VCAP computer system and they're reading about this unsolved triple homicide, all they can think about is how unbelievably similar the crime scene was to all the crime scenes of the student slayings, specifically that Julie had been arranged in this kind of suggestive pose like the other female victims in Gainesville. And on top of that, it was determined that the blood type of the killer in Shreveport was type B, same as the killer or killers in Gainesville. So there was a match in the the blood type. 
Somehow, after this discovery through this VCAP program, the media found out about this Shreveport unsolved triple homicide and how apparently it was incredibly similar to all these slayings that have taken place in Gainesville. And so before long, that was all every news network all over the United States was talking about. And at first, the police in Gainesville and anybody involved in this investigation was very upset about this because one, they probably had a leak that someone was giving information to the press, but two, the press was was kind of jeopardizing their investigation because by having these details leaked, the killer or killers could potentially benefit from kind of knowing what the police were thinking about and what they were up to. But as it would turn out, this particular leak would prove to be quite fruitful. Shortly after this news about the Shreveport killing and the student slayings was all over the news, this woman named Cindy who lived in Shreveport, she called the police after watching all the news like everybody else and told the police they really ought to look at this guy by Danny Rawling. Danny Rawling was this 37 year old drifter who was in Shreveport at the time of the Grissom family murders in 1989. And apparently after those murders, he had told Cindy's husband that he quote, had a problem and his problem was he liked stabbing people. And Danny literally always walked around with a huge knife on his waist. He seemed totally mentally unstable. And so this claim that he liked stabbing people, Cindy and her husband took literally and basically told him to stay away from them. And so in one of their last conversations with Danny, Danny actually told Cindy that he planned to leave Shreveport and go someplace where there's lots of beautiful young women that he can just stare at all day long. And so when police asked Cindy you know, do you think he's capable of killing all eight of these people? She said, oh yeah. And so the police turned their attention to Danny and began researching his background. And they discovered he was raised in a very abusive household. Specifically, his father really couldn't stand him. They had a really bad relationship. And then when Danny got old enough, he joined the Air Force, but he was kicked out after two years for being mentally unstable. And once he was discharged, he began the string of armed robberies in the 1980s. And he eventually got caught and spent the bulk of the 1980s in prison. And then in 1989, when he got out of prison, he came back to Shreveport and moved in with his parents. Now, this was not a happy homecoming. His parents did not want him living with them, but Danny kind of forced the issue. He had nowhere else to go, and so he wound up living there. And as it happened, they lived less than a half mile away from the Grissom family home. Six months after the Grissom family was murdered and three months before the Gainesville student slayings had begun, Danny gets in this huge fight with his father where his father actually draws a pistol and forces Danny to leave the house and tells him to never come back. And so Danny, he runs out of the house and he gets his gun from his vehicle, comes back inside his house and shoots his father point blank in the head and then in the stomach before fleeing the scene. His father would amazingly survive this attack despite some pretty significant damage to his head and he would tell the police and before long there was a warrant for Danny's arrest for attempted murder but when they went to go arrest him he was gone they had no idea where he went and so as the Gainesville police are looking at Danny's criminal record they're starting to say to themselves that this guy looks really interesting he does seem like he could be the serial killer we're looking for and so as they continue to dig deeper and deeper one of the Gainesville police officers suddenly thinks of something there was this unsolved armed robbery of this bank in Gainesville that happened the same week where all five of the students had been killed. A lone masked gunman walked into this bank in broad daylight and demanded money from the teller and the teller who thought on their feet gave him the cash but it was the type that was booby trapped with dye packets meaning if this robber tried to tamper with the money at all it would detonate sending dye all over them and kind of making it obvious that this money had been stolen. But the robber doesn't see this he takes the bag of cash, he leaves the bank and manages to flee and go into the forest before the police show up. And so the police ultimately they go and search the forest and they find this campsite deep in the woods and at this campsite which is abandoned they don't find the person who robbed the bank but at this campsite they find the bag that has the money inside of it and the dye packet has been activated so clearly the robber had tried to fiddle with it and then when it detonated they had taken off and left the money and then also at this campsite near this duffel bag full of ruined money was a screwdriver, a gun, and an audio recorder. Now, at the time, the police that were seeing this, they 
were part of this huge effort in Gainesville to stop any more attacks on students and catch the killer or killers. That was all they were thinking about. And so when they didn't immediately catch this robber, they kind of said, you know what? This is a lower priority item than what we're dealing with, with this loose serial killer or killers. And so let's just round up the evidence, put it in storage, and somebody else can deal with this after we handle this killer situation. And so no one listened to the audio recording. They just put it in evidence. They grabbed everything else, put it in evidence, and they threw it in the storage room. And so now this Gainesville police officer that's just remembered this unsolved armed robbery, he says to the group that's investigating Danny, he says, you know, hey, since Danny has a penchant for armed robbery, clearly he has a rap sheet full of armed robberies. Maybe if he was the serial killer and he killed all these students, that would have meant he was in Gainesville. And so maybe he committed this armed robbery. And so we should go look at the evidence and listen to that tape. And so the officers, they practically run to the storage locker. They get the evidence from this unsolved armed robbery. They come back and they hit play on this audio recorder. And what they hear is unbelievable. They hear on this recording a man singing a song. It's clearly a song he wrote. And he's singing about being a, quote, mystery killer. And then it kind of segues into him talking about how to effectively kill a deer with a knife, to be really effective with a knife. And he's getting into really graphic detail of how to do that. And then somewhat unbelievably on this audio recording, the man identifies himself. He says his name is Danny Rawling. And so this audio recording was huge. It meant Danny Rawling, the guy they're looking at as potentially being the serial killer, was definitely in Gainesville, in the woods, near the University of Florida, the same time frame that all of the victims were killed. Also, the screwdriver that had been found at this campsite matched the markings that had been made along the outside of some of the door frames of the victims' homes. They also went into Danny's military records and it showed he had a blood type of B. So his blood type matched the blood type that had been found in all of the victims' homes. And so just like that, Danny became the number one suspect. And when they went to figure out where he was, amazingly, they found he was already in custody. He was being held in a jail cell 40 miles south of Gainesville for another armed robbery. And so immediately, Danny was charged in the murders of the five Gainesville students. They couldn't charge him for the three Shreveport murders because they just didn't have enough evidence. And then after that, Danny was transferred to Florida's maximum security prison to await trial. Initially, Danny said he was innocent, he had nothing to do with the murders, but then almost four years later, when his trial was finally starting on the first day of his trial, he surprised everyone in the court when he stood up and said, I'm gonna change my plea, I'm guilty on all five counts. I did kill all five students. He would tell the court the reason he did this is he wanted to be a superstar like the notorious serial killer, Ted Bundy, who he looked up to. Danny would also, at another date, confess to killing the three Grissom family members in Shreveport. Because of Danny's detailed confessions, we now know all the terrifying details of what actually happened when he killed all eight of his victims. Back on Friday, November 3rd, 1989, Danny was fired from his job as a waiter at a local restaurant in Shreveport. And so he was frustrated, he was angry, and he was kind of walking around his neighborhood when he decided the way he would kind of channel his frustration was he would go kill some people. And so he was armed with his K-Bar knife, which he always carried with him. And he found himself standing in front of this little house and he saw some people moving around inside and he looked around, there wasn't anyone watching him. And so he just walked up to the front door, he tried the handle and it was unlocked. And so before he opened the door, he made sure his knife was in hand. He opened the door, walked right in, and he saw Sean, the eight-year-old, sitting on the couch watching TV. And without any hesitation, he walked up behind him and stabbed him through the back, killing him almost instantly. And then Danny walked into the kitchen where he found Tom, the grandfather, who was making steaks out on the back grill. And so he was going back and forth between the kitchen and the grill, kind of getting ready for dinner. And at some point, when Tom came back into the house and was holding steaks in his hand, Danny leapt out and stabbed 
grabbed him, and even though Tom put up a fight, he was very quickly subdued as well. And then after that, Danny made his way upstairs where Julie was, that was Sean's aunt, and she was getting ready for a wedding she was going to attend that night for one of her friends. And so she had just gotten out of her shower and she was getting ready to put on this red dress she had picked out. And Danny walked into her room and she most likely saw him, at which point Danny would have told her what he had just done to her loved ones downstairs. And he threatened her with the knife and said, if you don't listen to me, I'm gonna do the same thing to you. And because she was terrified, she listened to him. And so he immobilized her and then he sexually assaulted her and then he stabbed her to death. Afterwards, he cuts the tape off of her wrists and puts the tape in his pocket. And then he lays her out on her back on her bed. And then he goes downstairs and gets some vinegar and uses the vinegar to attempt to clean her body, to destroy any evidence he might have left behind. And then after cleaning her, he kind of puts her in that lewd, suggestive pose with her hands up over her head and her legs spread. And then he leaves. Six months later, in August of 1990, after Danny has shot his father and is on the run from the law, he finds himself in Gainesville, Florida, and he sets up this little camp just behind the University of Florida in this thick forest. And then on Friday, August 23rd, as he's sitting out at his campsite, he gets this sudden urge to go kill again. And so he waits for it to get dark out, and then he gets out his audio recorder, and he records himself alluding to this murder he is about to go perpetrate. Then, armed with a pistol, a screwdriver, and his K-bar knife, he left his campsite and walked in the darkness in the forest about a mile away until he was looking from inside the forest out towards this three-story white apartment building. And it's believed that within the last 24 hours, he had been in that area, and he had seen two young girls go in and out of this apartment building and that was all he needed to determine who his victims were going to be. And so those victims were Christine Powell and Sonia Larson. And so when he was standing in front of their apartment building, he eventually strode out of the forest. He walked up to that access door that led him into that stairwell. He made his way up to the door of Christine and Sonia, and he used his screwdriver to pop the door open. He went inside and shut the door behind him and walked into the living room, and he found Christine was sleeping on the couch. And so he left her be. He didn't touch her. He went upstairs, and he found Sonia sleeping on her bed. And so as he's standing there, realizing that he has these two girls, he needs to make a decision about which one he's going to kill first and which one he's going to sexually assault. And so as he's standing there looking over Sonya's bed, he decides he's going to kill Sonya and then he's going to sexually assault Christine. And so very casually, he walks into Sonya's room. She's fast asleep, she's on her back, and he pulls out a piece of duct tape and he gets the duct tape in one hand and he pulls his knife out in the other and he presses the duct tape over her mouth, which wakes her up, and then he drives the knife into her chest. And so Sonya would put up a pretty incredible fight, but ultimately she would succumb to her injuries. And then after she was dead, Danny just left her where she was and he went downstairs and he found Christine was still asleep on the couch. She had not woken up from the commotion upstairs. And so he walked right in front of her and standing over her with his knife, he kind of nudged her awake. And when she woke up, he had a piece of tape, he put it over her mouth and he told her to be quiet and held up the knife and told her that I just killed your roommate. And if you don't listen to what I'm gonna say, I'm gonna kill you too. And and so naturally she complied to what he wanted. And so she let her wrists be tied. And then at that point he cut her clothes off. He sexually assaulted her and then he stabbed her to death. And so after she was dead on the ground, he went and got that towel and that soap and he began cleaning Christine's body to try to remove any evidence he might've left behind. And then he cut the duct tape off of her wrist and removed the duct tape from her mouth and put those in his pocket. And then he positioned her in that kind of lewd, suggestive position that she was found in. And then Danny went back upstairs and cut the clothes off of Sonia and then positioned her on the side of the bed in a suggestive position as well. And then Danny leaves the apartment. So he goes back into the woods. He walks in the wood line back to his campsite. But when he got there, he was just too jacked up. He was too excited from what he had just done that he just couldn't control himself. All he wanted to do was go out and kill again. And so he managed to sit at his campsite for a total of eight hours before he couldn't help it any longer. He had to go back out and find another victim. And and so his next victim, he decided, would be this woman he just happened to see a couple of days ago. He was walking down the road near this row of apartments near the school, and he looked into one of them, and he just saw there was this girl in this apartment, and he just thought for a second, you know, I bet she lives alone there. But that was the entire interaction. He didn't know this person. He was just kind of guessing that she might be alone in there. And so here he is in the forest after killing these two teens, and he's like, okay, I'm going to go back to that apartment because I think that woman is alone. And that woman, 
would be Krista Hoyt. And so in the early morning hours of Saturday, August 24th, Danny leaves his campsite with his screwdriver, his gun, and his K-bar knife. And he walks about a half mile away from his campsite until he's still in the woods, but he's looking out at the back of Krista's apartment. And then at some point he walks out of the forest, he walks right up over her fence and gets up to her back sliding door. He uses a screwdriver to pop the sliding door open, he slides it open, he steps inside, and he finds out that Krista is actually not in her apartment. There's no one in her apartment. But instead of leaving and finding another victim, he decides he'll just wait for Krista. And so he shuts the sliding back door and he goes into her bedroom closet and shuts the closet and then just waits. And he stays in her closet for several hours until around 11 a.m. that morning, Krista comes home. And when she was in the house, he waited a little bit longer to make sure she didn't know he was there. And then at some point he kind of slipped out of the closet, snuck up behind her and put her in a chokehold. Now at first, Krista tried to fight back, but eventually she realized she could not overpower whoever this was. And at that point she said, okay, okay, you know, what do you want? And Danny would tell her, you got to listen to me or I'm going to kill you. And he showed her the knife. And so Krista said, okay. And she put her wrists out. He taped her wrists with duct tape. He put tape over her mouth. And then he brought her into her bedroom where he cut her clothes off and sexually assaulted her. And then afterwards, he stabbed her to death. Once she was dead, he cut the duct tape off of her wrists and pulled the duct tape off of her mouth and put that duct tape in his pocket. And then he positioned her body on the bed in a suggestive position before he left. When he got back to his campsite, he realized he had accidentally left his wallet in Krista's apartment. And so calm as can be, he walked back through the forest, right back into Krista's apartment. He found his wallet and he was about to leave when he thought to himself, well, wait a minute, I should mutilate her body. And so he pulled Krista's body off of the bed and using his knife, he decapitated her. He put her head up on the shelf next to the bed and then he repositioned her body on the edge of the bed, making it seem like she was kind of hunched over looking out the back door. And then before he left, he reached up and twisted her decapitated head and made it seem like it was looking down at the rest of her body. 48 hours later, on the evening of Monday, August 27th, Danny was back at his campsite out in the woods and he suddenly got the urge to go kill again. And so he stood up, he grabbed his knife, his screwdriver, and his gun, and he walked away from camp, made it about a mile through the woods until he was standing still in the forest looking out at this big apartment complex that was very commonly occupied by college students. And so at some point he leaves the forest and walks up to the first apartment he sees. He has no idea who's going to be in there and he goes up to their sliding back glass door. He gets a screwdriver out and he pops it open. He slides the door open. He steps inside and the first thing he sees is Manny Tabota, this big strong former football player who's laying in his bed and Danny just walks over and starts stabbing him and Manny wakes up and puts up one heck of a fight but ultimately Danny is able to overpower him and kills him. While Danny was stabbing Manny, the other resident inside of this apartment, 23 year old Tracy Paulus, she was in the shower and so she gets out of the shower and she hears all this commotion down the hall and so she steps into the hall and she looks into Manny's room and she sees Danny on top of him stabbing him. And so Danny looks back, he sees Tracy, Tracy screams, she runs down the hall into her bedroom, she slams the door behind her, she locks it, and then she leans up against the door to try to keep it shut. Meanwhile, Danny just continues to stab Manny until Manny is dead. And then Danny stands up and he just walks down the hall, calm as can be. He gets to the bedroom door where he knows Tracy is. She's trapped. She can't go anywhere. And he begins to smash the door down. He's ramming it with his shoulder. He's kicking it over and over again. And Tracy's screaming for him to stop. But eventually he manages to just kick the door down. And as soon as he's inside the room, Tracy kind of stands back and she says to Danny, are you the one? And Danny looks at her and says, yes, I am the one. And then he threatened her with a knife and said, I'll kill you just like the guy down the hall unless you listen to me. And so Tracy listened. She got her wrists bound and her face bound. And then Danny cut the clothes off of her and then sexually assaulted her. And then he stabbed her to death. And then after she was dead, he cut the duct tape off of her wrists and removed the duct tape from her mouth and then positioned her body in a suggestive sexual position on the edge of the bed. And then he left.
Later that day, Danny would rob that bank in Gainesville. And then one month later, Danny would be arrested for a botched armed robbery 40 miles south of Gainesville. And then while he was in prison, he would find out he was being charged with the five murders in Gainesville. 16 years later, at 6 p.m. on October 25th, 2006, Danny Rowling was led into the execution chamber in Florida State Prison. He offered no apology to the family members of his victims that were on the other side of the glass. Instead, Danny just sang a religious hymn to himself in order to comfort himself. And then 13 minutes later, Danny was pronounced dead. He was executed via lethal injection. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin Podcast. If you enjoyed today's stories and you're looking for more bone-chilling content be sure to check out all of our studio's podcasts Mr. Ballin Medical Mysteries Bedtime Stories. Just search for Ballin Studios wherever you get your podcasts and you'll find them all. Also there are hundreds more stories like the ones you heard today but in video format on our YouTube channel which is just called Mr. Ballin. I really appreciate your support until next time see you.